Hello everyone, my name is Alicia Jackson, Licensed Professional Counselor, and welcome to my channel. Today we are reviewing Married at First Sight, Season 17, Episode 15. Here at this channel, we do a different type of therapeutic review. We do a different type of review where we get a little curious. We try not to, right? Jump to conclusions or make assumptions or even come at a space that's critical, but really try to get to understand and wonder what's happening? What's happening internally for the couples, the participants of this experiment to hopefully learn a little bit about relationships and even potentially learn a little bit about ourselves. If you are returning, please like the video and of course subscribe to the channel. Now let's get started. First we have Michael and Chloe and they are waking up from their wedding night and they have a little discovery during the night as Chloe is having some panic attacks at night. Michael in his, um, like it's almost like this part of him that's very charming. It seems like it doesn't want to make Chloe uncomfortable in any way. So Michael has these parts of him that are going out of his way to make sure she's comfortable at all times. And also at the same time, he's also trying to make sure that he's okay like he's getting the feedback and things that he needs and and to make sure to reassure him to make sure she's okay like if you're okay then I'm okay so he is going over and beyond and one of the ways he was doing this was like through a, a humorous side of him was like okay do would you like to see like what it was like for me to experience your panic attacks and he did it in a way that wasn't patronizing or belittling, but in a way that was like, hey, this happened. And he even like described her panic attacks as adorable or cute. Um, so he was framing it in a way of like, hey, I don't want you to feel uh, self-conscious about this. Or I don't want you to feel like this is um, something that I am uncomfortable with. But this is this is a part of you. And I'm okay that this, this is here. I'm okay that you are having these panic attacks it's okay and so he reenacted this moment where she like wakes up startled she named that she has panic attacks uh during her sleep and she's been having them for years uh in situations that are very stressful and you know i'm grateful this is one thing that i am really grateful about internal family systems again that's the type of therapy that i utilize and uh, the model that i utilize in my work with my clients and even in my own work that we can get curious about what these panic attacks are trying to communicate to her. There, there is a reason why they're happening. It's not like, oh, I get stressed and I panic and I need to find ways to calm myself. It's like, oh, the part of me that is is carrying all of this alert energy is the reason why it's here. I wonder what it needs from Chloe. And I'm wondering if she can get curious about that to attend to whatever that part of her is concerned about why we can make assumptions or analyze like oh of course you're getting married at first sight and there is this strange man in your in your in your bed with you and what could happen but there's so much there's so much connected to this big huge step that she's making for herself especially with a part of her wanting to have things planned out wanting things to be perfect married at first sight is like completely the opposite of that so leaning in, getting curious, mm, why is this here? What, what, what are the concerns? Because there's a way that she could even show up for herself and take care of herself so that she'll be able to trust herself through this process and whatever that looks like. But Michael is also trying to go over and beyond and take care of her too, right? He even named, well, okay, I'm glad I know that it's during the night so that I don't have to be alert like all times a day. Just at night, I know that, hey, this is happening. Uh, Chloe also named that she said, well, I do tend to sleep a little light and I didn't have my white noise machine. I didn't have this. I didn't have that. So she has these sleep aids to help her. And she has a part of her that has been accustomed to having these things. And it sounds like that part is even hoping that, oh, maybe, maybe Michael could provide some resolve some reassurance and maybe I won't need these things and it also again I'm just thinking back to how mom was showing up with Chloe right before she walked down the aisle that this reassuring calm that was just like just came in like it's okay 
um, it seems like that's something that is that's a dynamic in their relationship that they've had to play out often. And that's the role maybe that mom plays in Chloe's life and that she needs that. And so wondering, wow, what would it be like for Chloe to have her own calm that she can she can have access to and and really build a relationship to. Right. But we don't know. We don't know how old this one is that's panicking in t- inside of her, like how young they are, what what they're really concerned about. We don't know. We just know that they're here, and so they're trying to to navigate around it. Chloe also named that touch. Touch is a way that she uses to keep herself grounded, that she uses to to connect, and that it's welcome. And she named that multiple times in this episode. Touch me, Michael. I think <laughs> she even yelled, just touch me, right? So, like, she is wanting that, needing that from him, and and she doesn't right even though later on the episode she said that she doesn't really like to ask for help or lean in and and ask for these things she's saying what she needs from him and so that's a that's a that's a step in the right direction it's a step in the right direction for their connection for their intimacy uh that he won't have like questions in his mind like oh does she, is, is is it okay for me to lean in is it okay for me like she's stating what she needs so they have their honeymoon at Cheyenne Mountain a resort a part of me is like man they didn't get to go anywhere far because of how things happen but it seems like they are making the best of it and he helped her with the luggage he helped her with the luggage he was he was uh putting her belongings around now even though she did name that he had a lot of bags and he talked about how he had to have different clothes and matching and you know all the things we saw the name brands you know that he that were in the the baggage so he's he is A person, right, who does like to have his things and to be coordinated and to present himself in a certain way. And we also see that Chloe has a part of her that's leaning into it and um, she's observing it. She's aware of it. And at the same time, she's not knocking him forward or judging him or trying to pull him in her direction. I don't see that as of yet. Right. It may be something that she's like, well, maybe we could like instead of having six bags of luggage, maybe just have too right but she is she just leaning in and accepting him for who he is as of now it's only been a few days and so michael is doing uh this part of him that's testing the waters right it's still here and he's saying okay so tell me what you're looking for what you're hoping for for the honeymoon what are you expecting or looking to experience and um he said he's just really trying to grab information about like, oh, what would it be like for us to share a space together? What would that be like? How how are we going to experience each other? This honeymoon can give us a foretaste of that. And ask Chloe, what are you looking forward to? And she said, I just looking forward to us having fun. And I don't know if you saw Michael's response to that, like in his facial expression, there was a smile, but there was almost like, ah, it felt like she was, she has a part of her, I'm seeing potentially that it's like very optimistic and doesn't always necessarily communicate what's really here, what's really she's holding. It just tries to put on like, everything's great. Everything's good. Everything's awesome to try to even um, take care of him. Maybe like a part of her is almost trying to reassure him while reassuring herself at the same time. And instead of saying what she's really looking forward to, and she said, well, hey, you don't know uh, in her confessional, like you don't know what could happen. Honeymoons have a, a, a unique way of bringing, you know, the a lot out of people. And so she's leaning into it. And she's also, you can see that there's a part of her that is leaning in to do some really extreme things that she may not want to do. Like when she has this fear of heights and they're doing the the rock climbing and their the zip lining line i saw that i don't know if they did that but they were doing a lot of things that were surrounding heights there's a part of her that like is pushing her to lean into her fears like don't let fear stop you and so we know that then there's one that does let fear stop or does say hey help help right there's the one that's got the panic attacks and or that causes the panic attacks internally and then there's the one that's like let's do all the things that are we're afraid of let's push through it don't let fear stop us okay and so it seems like the one that is like pushing her to do things 
is in the driver's seat. And the one that has the fear, that has the panic, is like sitting in the back. It's like maybe uh, tied and gagged. <laughs> it's like, help, help. We have concerns. And she's like, we're not going to let fear stop us. And ooh, what could it be like for Chloe to have both of them sit with her? The one that doesn't want fear to stop her and the one that has those concerns to hear them out and be present with them. Right. That's that's the goal. Um, Because the yin and the yang that we often deal with can be so much. It can be such a jarring experience internally and often does cause that. Because once this one that's like, we're not going to let fear stop us. Once it it gets tired of doing this job, it gets fatigued. It gets, it's like, whew, okay, we'll keep pushing through and things are scary. Then the one that's like, we have all these concerns kind of pulls the reins from them and then she's then she's taken over with panic then she's taken over with fear which we see that a little bit um at the end of the episode so they are in this conversation as they've climbed the mountains and all the things that michael and her are exploring their fears he talked about he has some fears like he has a healthy respect of the ocean and he also too doesn't like to ride the roller coasters where you go upside down he's like as a kid he really didn't like that and he's He's still kind of scared of it, but not as much as he was as a child, right? So he's naming that. And Chloe, too. Chloe, too, is saying, hey, I can also be a a strength for you, too, right? Like, don't let these panic attacks fool you. I can also be a support, and I want to be a support for you, too. And so they even explore that a little bit more. Michael names, like, well, I do have a part of me that doesn't like to be a burden, Um, as Chloe named that for herself as well. And he said, well, when that happens, that sometimes what will happen is like my schedule will get really out of whack and I'll start to, you know, get panicked. And so that's something to be on the lookout for as well. So he was giving her some insights and some things that he has paid attention to. He's become aware of for himself. And I feel like both, that's a place where both of them can get curious too around, hmm, you don't want to be panicked. You don't like to be a burden. You don't want people to feel burdened by your presence or burdened by needs that you have. So then you don't say anything. Okay. What could be a way, right? What could be a way to to, to mitigate that in a way that feels centered, that feels less from the place of let's not say we can be suffering, but we're not going to tell anybody until well, I'm in a pool of tears and I'm overwhelmed and I can't even function on a daily basis because my schedule is right so much. What could it be like for us to find the balance between the two and say, ah, okay, all right, I need help. I need help in realizing that needing help doesn't mean that that's taking away from you or also doesn't mean that you are maybe potentially putting yourself at risk. Because sometimes that's what needing help can feel like. Because if I say I need help, then I'm putting myself at risk for someone to say that they can't help me. And all we can do is ask. And so that means that maybe potentially there's been some disappointment out there. Um, Michael also named later in the episode too that his upbringing, he was taught at a 14-year-old how to show up like an adult when his father passed and I had so much curiosity around that and so I'm wondering if that's connected to this I don't know but I'm wondering yeah what's there around that so they are continuing to talk about their culture and their upbringing as they were both raised in different areas in Denver it seems and so she's learning a little bit about Michael's culture same for Chloe and they talk about family. Family comes up and we learn that Michael has a really close relationship with his sister and his mother. And specifically, his sister and his mother have a very close relationship because they live um, in the same area. I believe he said Vegas, I believe. Don't quote me if I'm off. But I believe it was Vegas. And she said, well, do, does your mother know that you are married or she know about me and he said you know no she doesn't uh she doesn't 
that my sister knows, but my mom had a huge reaction to me even getting into this process. So I imagine she had a, another reaction to it not going well. And then a way that he's protecting himself from any responses that she might have to him going through this process again. He did not tell her about it. So, hmm. Something for Michael to get curious about is how protecting you, right, from your mother's response, how that impacts your mom, your sister, and now Chloe. He's wondering what the impact is. And again, Michael has a part of him that tries to come in to tell people. I don't even think he, of course, knows it. We, we rarely are aware that we're doing this, but he said... You know, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to hide you or, you know, keep you away from my mom or or hide this marriage. That's not what I'm trying to do. Right. I don't want you to think that. Well, I'm glad he communicated that. And at the same time, it would be interesting for Michael to instead of saying that because he has a part of him that's like, I don't want you to think that I don't want you to think I'm a broken man. I don't want you to think that I'm hiding this relationship. What could it be like for Michael to say? And I'm wondering what you're thinking about that. I made the decision to not tell my mom that I got married again at first sight. Tell me your thoughts. To really know. To really hear her out. To see what's there. Because he doesn't give her room in those spaces to really communicate what she's feeling. And then what happens is the part of her that wants to take care of him and reassure him shows up to do that. Instead of opening up the lines of communication to say, tell me, tell me your thoughts about that. She's like, well, you know, who knows what comes out, right? Who knows how she's really feeling and thinking. She did say in the after party that it's something that she's like, okay, I'm giving a pause. I'm, I'm, I'm making a mental note. And at the same time, I'm still trusting Michael through this process, right? Because we know Emily had some, had some really strong opinions about which we'll talk about later in this review and at the same time chloe kind of held her own and said well i'm making a mental note and i'm also trusting michael in this in this process too so i'm doing both and so the next time we see michael and chloe they're getting couple massages uh they're interacting to seeing each other less clothed and um, Michael asked her a question, which I thought was so interesting. <laughs> I really did. I was like, what is Michael wanting from this question? I wonder, right? Um, he asked her, this is your first time seeing me in this way, like not as clothed. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you notice, anything that you uh, want to make a comment on. And I was like, this is a very interesting exploration here. Uh, it takes a lot of bravery because he just opened himself up, all right? There's a part of him or, you know, you could say a multiple things. What comes up for me is, wow, how brave to open himself up to her to say, like, you got a lot of tattoos. That's a bit much. Who knows? Um, or to say, hmm, a part of you is really making sure that she's attracted to you. Because we know he has that part of him that's, like, was worried or wondering if the reason why the first woman did not choose to go through with the process is because of his appearance because that's the only thing that she had we don't know we don't know why she made that decision that's a lot of assumptions are being made on his part around that and so he's asking this question if that's the reason why he's asking it it feels like it but who knows why he is and so she named that she's never dated anybody with any tattoos and that michael has chosen to document his life which I feel like is a is a great way to describe that because he does have some meaningful um, meanings behind his his art on his body and she's like you know it's just a really beautiful expression of that and she's saying she likes what he see she sees she likes his hair she likes this and he named like oh I love like your lips your eyes and the way you look it's just there's so much intent in your eyes and 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 she's like, oh, I just love your list, right? So they are enjoying each other. They're sharing their likes. And 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 also, to there was an invitation, right? Michael, Michael, would you like to touch 
Chloe or massage Chloe. And she said, please, Michael, massage me, which again, I, I this part of her that is like, please, please do. Um, there's, I get excited about that um, because I feel like this is, this is a, again, a way for them to lean into each other. Um, and again, a way of her communicating that with, uh, with some passion, with some enthusiasm, it really helps to calm down any of the concerns potentially that Michael has about this not being what he's what he's thinking it is, right? If he may be second guessing it, second guessing the connection or, ooh, should I touch her? Should I not touch her? The victim, she's like, please massage me, Michael, please. That helps him to lean in more confidently to connect in with her. And we see that, like, she's thoroughly enjoying it. He's also, um, in a jokingly way, he has a part of him that's still, like, using uh, some jokes uh, to calm the potential awkwardness in the air. Like, oh, I got, you know, these small hands, they don't seem much, but, ooh, they're pretty strong. Like, there's something there. Michael has some parts of him, which we all do, that are carrying some some insecurities potentially about his appearance, and they do come out, and they're here. They're welcome, you know, and Chloe isn't, um, sh- you know, sh- Chloe isn't calling him out on it and everything. She's leaning in. She's leaning in, and she's enjoying the massage, and they're connecting. Uh, later on, they have a dinner. They have a dinner together as they're preparing to end their honeymoon and move in that shared apartment like it's happening. It is going down. So, Chloe comes in with, hey, I've been thinking. I've been doing a lot of thinking. And we've had some great conversations, conversations I haven't had with anybody that I've been in any relationship with for longer periods of time. And at the same time, what is this about to be like? And I have a part of me that is panicking. And he's like, yeah, I do too. I'm concerned about the unknown. And it's it's almost like she, this part of her that's panicking, the one that's in the back seat that has gagged, the one that analogy I was bringing out to you, is, is taking the, <laughs> is somehow removed the gag from its mouth. And it's like, yeah, I don't know if I could do this. Okay. And, and what, what was great to see in this moment is Michael to not dismiss her, her panic, even to not even come in like everything's going to be fine because we don't know that, right? We don't know that. Oftentimes that can be, that can be the response to the part of us that has panic or the part of us that's needing that reassurance. We want to say everything's going to be fine. We don't know that. We really don't know that. And so the fact that he's saying, hey, I can be supportive. You know, I try to read where you are. I try to see where you are and and see what you need from me. And she's like, hey, which is is also a beautiful um, observation awareness that Chloe's saying like, hey, actually, you know, it's not your job. It's not your job to and it's not fair to you for you to like constantly be assessing what mood I'm in and and knowing what I need, like that's something I need to do for me. And she said, what I noticed for myself is that I tend to shut down my feelings and then they start to bubble up and then it makes, right, the other person awkward. And right, so she's naming all of this, these beautiful notices that she's having about how she shows up. Because oftentimes we're not always aware. We're not always aware of how we're showing up. So the fact that she's leaning into that getting more curious about what's happening and for her so she can show up for herself. And she's like, I need to do that. And so Michael said, well, hey, I'm going to support you, right? This part of him that wants to support her is like, hey, I'm going to support you, all right? So I want you to do what best serves you, okay? And I'm also going to be whatever emotional support I need to be, whether it's just you crying on my shoulder, whatever that looks like, okay? And Chloe is just gobsmacked by this response. She's like, he's asking me to do what best serves me. Oh my goodness. I don't... She's like, he's asking me to be selfish. And that's what it feels like when someone tells us to do what you need to do for you. And we're so used to taking care of other people. It can sound selfish when when they're, when they're we're in that energy. But it's not. It's really not selfish at all. 
to do what she needs to do to take care of her because if she does that then she can better show up for him when she does that so it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful exchange and how they're meeting each other and I'm hoping too that Michael will be able to to be more himself too in a, in a relaxed way both of them do have their protection of their layers of like making sure both of them are okay not saying too much right and so some things are are not being said some things are not being said and we'll see how that that comes to unfold as they continue to get to know each other and and test the safety in the relationship next we have Becca and Austin and Becca and Austin are coming back from Philly visiting Austin's grandparents and hmm they had some some interesting happenings a while away as there were two cats I believe at his grandmother's home where they were staying and it caused some allergies and some issues for Austin which limited their ability to connect with each other and be intimate with each other as they were working on this and this this upset and disturbed Becca so uh, and you can see this as they are sitting down they are preparing for Dr. Pia to come and Austin says hey are you going to um, you know blind spot me or hit me with something in this counseling session that I don't know about, she's like, no, I just, um, you know, the intimacy thing is the thing. And he's like, okay, that's what I thought. Okay. And it's like, yeah, we just, we just haven't had time. She's like, Dr. Pia said, we make time. And I said, oh, there's some anger there. There's a part of her that has this and they have this picture of her and I will play it right now this picture this part of her that really exudes that energy that's like everything is great and in Becca's world everything is not great right now everything is not great the part of her that's questioning of whether Austin really wants to be in this relationship whether whether Austin is really attracted to her is 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 ever present I feel I sense and it's needing that reassurance for him it, and it's relying on touch to do that. And so I'm wondering where this is coming from. Like, ooh, right? I have a wonder, like, ooh, what was Becca's um, relationships like growing up as a child? How did she come to know she was beautiful? How did she come to know she was wanted? All the things I have questions about because it seems to be like, ooh, it's showing up in, in her relationship with Austin this way. I also have questions about the pressure. Austin named this at the after party and he also stood his ground too with Emily who said, why don't you just, you know, why don't you just do it? Why don't you just go ahead and do the deed? And he's like, whoa. Um, which again, we'll, we'll name that a little bit later as we talk about Emily and Brennan, but he held his ground and saying like, you know, it's just something he's not ready to do. I really sense that he's in a place where he's, again, still trying to decide, am I going to say yes on decision day? Because I don't want to open that door if I'm not going to do that. And at the same time, that's also having an impact on Becca. And so I don't know if Austin's really truly being 100% honest with Becca about where he really is. I know he's fond of her. I sense that. I don't know for sure, but I sense that he is. I sense that he's fond of her, since that he cares about her. And at the same time, Becca's saying, hey, I'm putting out these bids to connect and I'm getting rejected. And there's only so much rejection I can take. And so we can see the pressure he's feeling because even in a moment, right before the this, this session with Dr. Pia, she said, well, I'm putting the ball in your court. And he's like, I know. you can. It's, it's like that pressure is on him, which again is going to make this even more challenging, even more difficult because intimacy is just the issue. Even when Dr. Pia sits down, she meets the fish, but the next thing is, so how's the intimacy thing going? And it's like, you know, it's the way it's being explored. It's like literally like a flashlight's being put in Austin's face. That's what it feels like. And it's like, what have you done to make the intimacy grow in your relationship today? You know, and it's <laughs> and I can't imagine that's going to make him want to lean in 
towards intimacy is going to make him even more panicked than he named that it makes him get in his head when they're at their last session with Dr. Pia before going to see his grandmother. And so ah, I really feel for them where they are right now. Um, Austin did name the issues and reasons why, right? He wasn't feeling leaning in towards intimacy and also being around his grandparents and not feeling comfortable in that way and Becca said yeah I understand that I understand that I'm not asking him to do that and at the same time the flirting like not none of it's there none of it's there and there's there's something there and I'm, I'm I would love for Austin to have some time by himself with an expert to really explore that some and really, really sit with that. And also Becca too, right? Because it's, it's two to tango. Uh, Austin's not the issue. And it feels like that can be implied when, oh, we're waiting for someone else to do something. And at the same time, ooh, why is there so much pressure on a person to do uh, something? You know, it's almost like there's, um, uh, there could be even like a, a double standard. There are beliefs around um, cisgender men who in physical intimacy and cisgender women in physical intimacy there's double standards there's a lot of cultural norms that we're placing on on both of these people and not realizing that that he's an individual he's an individual and he believes and responds in a way that feels right for him and pressuring him to do that what does that mean what's the impact of that on him and what is the impact of that on becca that she's not getting this and what meaning is being attached to that and what part of her needs to be acknowledged around that. So there's there's a lot here that I feel like we're just like dealing with at the surface level and just saying, oh, just go ahead and do this exercise. While that's helpful, while that's helping create the intimacy, there's something there internally that's causing this to be the main focus of their relationship which is even making it even more astronomical than it has to be i feel at this time yes it's been some weeks and at the same same time it's only been some weeks too so like both things are true who it's been some weeks and it's been some weeks and plus the pressure and the cameras and the you know it's a lot austin is seems like he's also not the person who likes to talk about private things on camera and yes he did sign up to be married at first sight i know i have the i know that we have those parts of us that say well this is what you signed up for absolutely absolutely and at the same time we don't know what's going to happen when we sign up for certain things we sign up to be in a relationship and nine times out of ten what we expect to have happen usually doesn't and unexpected things happen that we don't expect and we have to navigate it in a way right that looks right for us austin has to do the same thing for him and becca has to do the same thing for her so i'm hoping oh i wish that they could have some time separate time with the experts that's what i feel is needed in this relationship to really help sit with this in a way that doesn't feel like well, what's your problem? Well, what's your problem? Kind of feel, because that's what it's giving. That's what it's giving. Lastly, we have Brennan and Emily. Here we go. Okay. So they are using the talking paddle as they are seeing that they're having a hard time interrupting each other or listening to each other. And so they're using the talking paddle uh, to make sure they don't do that. And Emily stated that, Last session, we broke. I broke Brennan's trust, uh, and so I'm. We want to talk through that. And this conversation was interesting to me. It was really interesting to me, because you can see the part of Emily that feels stifled. You can see the part of her that feels stifled. That doesn't feel like she can say what she really wants to say. You also see the part of Brennan that is not saying the things that he really feels so there's both are true both are here both are happening they're talking about trust they're talking about 
uh, their relationship, their friendship. Uh, they talked about the wedding and how Emily said that people were talking to her and saying, wow, it doesn't even seem like you guys are in a friendship. And then Brennan kind of, and then kind of, he deflected and he had a part of him that made it about the people coming to talk to her to say, hey, it doesn't seem like you're, you are friends versus about Emily feeling potentially like she wasn't being treated that way and how it's making her sad or hurting her feelings, right, to hear this and making it, well, you can choose, you can choose to ignore them, not listening to them. Like it's her, it's, he's putting it all on her to do. And remember, we're, we're not, you know, we're not in a romantic relationship. We're just friends. We're just, we're not in a marriage. We're friends. And you can see the confusion on Emily's face because she's a part of her is saying like, hey, oh, I have bigger expectations for this relationship. I, I, I want more than friendship. You, you see that in her, but you see that Brennan is like completely closed off from that being an option, even though sometimes he says otherwise. He even says it later on in this episode with Pastor Cal. Uh, and at the same time, you see it ever so that he does not mean that, that he wants something more than this, what this friendship is. In this conversation too, Emily named that she is semi, she said, losing herself. as she is doing what feels right for him, but not really honoring herself. That's what I heard. Her saying she even named that too in her relation in her conversation with her friend, um, and I don't know if Brendan is really aware that that's happening. He has a part of him that is trying to protect his appearance on camera. A part of him that is trying to protect Emily by not telling her how he really feels about this relationship and really where he's at. He he really isn't being honest because I just a part of me really feels like he's done. He's done with it. And he doesn't realize by not doing those things, it seems to me that he's completely unaware of that because his, even his friend named it, right? He gets so focused on the thing that he just loses sight of everything. Like, that's what's happening. <laughs> he's, like, so focused on these are my boundaries. And it's not even boundaries. They're, like, barriers. They're, like, rigid barriers. We are friends. We are friends, right? Nothing else. No emotions. We're not talking about emotions, right? Because I don't want to talk about my feelings with you. That's what's there. So we're, we're shutting down the door. This is a brick wall, and we we cannot open it. These are like very rigid boundaries. Emily's chatting with Claire uh, and about this, and Claire's like, he silences you. He doesn't want you to be who you really are. I don't like this. Um, this isn't even a friendship. She's like fussing. She has this anger and fire for her. Don't know where it's coming from. So then even for Claire to get curious about like, ooh, where's all this fire coming from for for Emily? And not to say that it's not warranted because what Emily's going through is not okay. It's like she's not okay uh, at all. And, and you can see it. You can just see it, especially in the after party. I don't want to get too ahead of me, but... She, you can really see in the after party, like, she's not okay. She's not okay. I'm really concerned. Claire did say to, uh, around her and Cameron, a little excerpt about them, that she has a part of her that's, like, calling to make sure he's okay because she doesn't want to be out having fun while he's going through this big, big thing. I feel, and I even, I don't know who he texts. I think it was Brennan, uh, that he doesn't, like, he doesn't want Claire to be calling him like this he's kind of even almost annoyed by it and it's like I feel when Cameron said he wanted a divorce like that was the end for him in some regards and he is focused on him and taking care of his health because that was his concern that was the whole reason why he was trying to have that conversation and the fact that she, she's in a place where she's still still feeling like oh I don't know I don't know how I'm supposed to show up for him he's like I don't I don't need that from you and I'm wondering what it would be like for Claire to respect that. If Cameron's going to say that outright. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if he's going to say that outright to her. But if he were to do that, 
would she be able to do that? Would she be able to respect it and allow him to to be and to have the level of friendship or relationship that he needs to have with Claire in order to feel safe and secure and like he's taking care of himself. Emily also named in her conversation with Claire that this friendship thing is causing much more stress on her than even the marriage. She's like, it's a brain shift that she just really can't make. It's hard. It's hard for her to, to fit in this friendship box when she is in a marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Emily, it is. It's a challenge because that's not what this is. That's not what this is. And speaking of, if that's not what this is, they're having and preparing for a conversation with Pastor Cal. And Emily, is she's speaking for the part of her that's nervous, saying like, I don't know how this this is going to go because these sessions really never go well. I don't know what to say and what not to say. And she even named that with Brennan. He made like this smirk kind of feeling like, uh, well, she's like, yeah, I don't know what what's okay to say. I don't know. And how you're going to take what I'm saying, especially since the last session with Dr. Pia, he felt like she disrupted his his trust. And that's what he named because she said what they're experiencing and, and talked about. And, and later in the episode, her friend even came to her rescue. Like, you broke his trust by saying what you needed to say in a counseling session. And so there's a lot of control that's happening here. And I, I really need Brennan. I need <laughs> I need Brennan to get, or I would love for Brennan to get curious about what this control is about. Really what it's about. Uh, I really sense that what he feels it's about isn't really what it's about. And so Pastor Cal did something um, pretty, pretty interesting. Okay, he had them watch their interviews when they first started this process he said i just want you to take a look to see he said because i know you both are in in the like most romantic space in your marriage but i want you to see these interviews to see this because i really really felt like you both were compatible for each other so they watched emily's first and both of them agree yeah same woman brennan said yeah that's her because emily even named like her her challenges, like, yeah, I get really emotional, so I got to watch how I say things, and I'm working on that, you know. So she named all of that and how she's going to stick. She wants to stick with it. When the times get hard, she's going to stick with it, and she has, like, she has. For a person who's never been in a relationship, like, Emily has this part of her that's, like, will not let go, and it's because it's, like, I know that you care about me. I know that you you used to. You used to like me. Where's where's that, where's that part of Brennan at? Like, it's almost like she's, like, in a hide-and-go-seek kind of, situation to to try to find that part of him that was at the beginning of their relationship and so then they watch Brennan's video and there's mixed reviews uh there's mixed reviews here as Emily said well you know some of the things that he says like loyal and trust all those things are important to him yes those are all still there and at the same time she named well you know we all were speaking from a place of being interviewed so he may have had his game face on or he wanted to speak of like how he wants to be versus maybe how he is and that's what I sense right sometimes when we're asking questions we don't know how we're going to show up so I want to give Brennan that grace and at the same time um when the times get hard too we have to also remember what what we said and hold ourselves to that standard too and it seems like that's not happening for Brennan, right? I'm going to trust the process because you guys picked this person. I'm going to trust the process. Well, Brennan has not been trusting the process. He's been bucking up against the process. He's been protecting himself through the process. He has been, right, doing all of these things and has caused distance in his relationship between him and Emily because of that. And that is that is a factual thing. She named that. Pastor Cal said, okay. Okay, well, when we say this word friend, that puts a nail in the coffin in your relationship. And this is not friends at first sight. This is married at first sight. And Brennan asked Brennan, you know, would you be able to or open to exploring more with Emily if if she were open to that? He said, yeah, of course. And I don't believe that that's a fact. I, I, I believe that that's him 
doing what he feels he needs to do to keep Pastor Cal on his good side, right? Or, I don't know if there's a part of him that's like, I need to keep these experts on my good side or to keep them, um, you know, thinking of me in a positive light. I want to be liked. Um, if that's taking the front seat over him, really speaking for what he's willing it feeling and thinking about this relationship because I don't feel like I feel like Emily right now wants something deeper with Brennan and at the same time he's saying no and so Emily stated like your words your words were in that interview you said what you meant but it hasn't shown up in your actions and then Brennan said out loud he said out loud well it's different that's different when there's like a romantic relationship that's different I feel like in that moment Brennan was saying where he was and that wasn't that wasn't addressed at all like I don't know if Pastor Cal said something but they edited it out I don't know but on camera that wasn't addressed and I'm like whoa I just feel like Brennan just said something that we need to stop and pause around like whoa yeah it is different tell me tell me for you when it changed right when did it stop being romantic for you because here it's romantic when you're in this interview. When, when, when did it change? When did it stop being romantic? I wonder if Brennan would give himself permission to say that and to really be honest about that. And so Emily is talking with her friend. She's talking with her friend via video chat. And she said, hey, you've been texting me. Uh, but, you know, you're texting a bit cryptic. And she's talking about Brennan and how he's showing up, how... In, in counseling ses sessions, right, that Emily has, has to watch her words or on camera, Emily has to watch her words. And her friend is asking really, really interesting questions, thoughtful questions like, oh, how does he show up for you? What does he do to him? bring value to you? What is he what is he doing instead of requiring so much of you? What is he doing for you? How is he showing up for you? And it's hard. Emily isn't really naming much. She just says that she cares about him. Um, and her friend, even though she named it, she said, hey, you can make the decision or choice that you want and at the same time run for the hills. So it's like you're telling her you want her to end this relationship. Understood. Understood. It's, I see that it's, it's causing more harm than anything for Emily. And we see how that's showing up at the after party. I wish. We can't go back because the after party has already been taped, right? I wish that Emily would be excused from these after parties. The reason why I, I, I have this concern is because I know she's not okay. She's hurting so much around this and there's so much protection. Every incident or every conflict or concern that's happening in other people's relationships, you hear her fighting for herself while she's doing it well, why don't you just do that because you know that's how much that's hurting her why don't you just tell the truth oh claire doesn't know that uh cameron is is annoyed by her texting why don't you why don't you just say it right you hear because she's in a situation where brennan just won't say the things so we see how emily is fighting for herself in everybody's relationship and that's what's happening on the after party and oh emily's already fighting so much with brennan Maybe we should save her from fighting in other people's relationships on camera too. And then she has to see footage of herself being severely injured, it seems, from the footage we see at the re at the retreat next week, on the next week's episode. I just, it's, for me, I have parts that are really concerned about Emily's um, emotional state and the exposure to be like re-triggering all of this stuff and her not being protected through any of it any of it her feelings really it's the irony of it all right because Brennan is this part of him that's like I just I don't want to hurt her feelings and at the same time he has disregarded her feelings throughout the process helping her move in her hair getting like cut out of her scalp uh her falling while he was in the shower and her arm like he has, it's, it's been a challenge. It has been a challenge for Emily to go through this and then also to constantly be putting in this box of being a friend versus a wife and being, being 
felt the distance. It's like she's alone in this relationship, even though he's saying that he's showing up for her and he's she's telling Claire and she's telling her friend that this is the best that he can do. I hear her. I hear her and I a part of me even agrees with her. I'm just gonna be honest, part of me does because this is protection. So and at the same time, I do see where Brennan can show up for her as well more by just communicating, communicating with her. Really, honestly and true. If it, even if it's just something off camera, have the cameras leave. Say hey, yeah, this is just becoming too much. I'm gonna go, and then it can go from there. But for whatever reason, that's not happening. We're just going to wait this thing off to decision day because that's what it seems like is happening. And I am concerned. I'm concerned for for Emily um, going through this and reliving all of this on camera through the after party. Like everybody's relationships is touching her stuff. It's a it's a whew, it's a lot. You let me know your thoughts. Let me know your thoughts about where Michael and Chloe are, where Brennan and emily are where becca and austin are even if you have thoughts about cameron and claire hey check them out we also get to see so brace yourselves that orion and lauren will be back on camera and on screen next episode if you are still with us be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel and as always be cool be calm be centered peace